Welcome, everybody. So glad you could make it here for the herbaceous perennials of the suburban yard. And Nancy Veers is president of the Virginia Native Plant Society and the Prince William Wildflower Society. Oh, she covers a selection of perennial native plants in this uh, presentation. And uh, going right to her bio, Nancy Veers is a native of Northern Virginia and a product of Prince William County Schools. How many of you know, native, uh, know Nancy as you've met her over the years? A lot of people. She's very well known in the community. Um, she joined the Virginia Native Plant Society in 1988 and has served as the president since 2012. She also serves as the president of her local chapter, uh, the Prince William Wildflower Society. Growing up in Manassas near the banks of the Bull Run River, Nancy traces her love for wildflowers to her discovery of blooming Virginia bluebells. And we all love those on the banks of any river in this area that's kept natural, natural banks. She, um, her love of wildflowers is, goes on, it started as a young girl. No surprise, conservation of native plants and their habitats is central to her mission in retirement. Of her many conservation organizations, Nancy is a member. Uh, she is an active member and former board director of Prince William Conservation Alliance. Of some Alliance people might be here today. Um, a member and past president of Prince William Committee of 100. Board director of Upper Occoquan Service Authority. It's a water reclamation public utility and a member. With her companion, Harry Glasgow, her lead regular, she leads regular walks at Huntley Meadows Park in Fairfax County and Mary Mack Farm Wildlife Management Area in Prince William County. And uh, if you follow her on Facebook, you'll see her lovely photos. She does some of the finest nature photos in, in our area locally. So with uh, Nancy and Harry share their Manassas area home with two delightful cats. And you also see them occasionally on Facebook. <laughs> Little Nikki and Henry David. So with that, take it away, Nancy. Thank you, Tim. Tim is with Watershed Management. So I don't think we got your name when you started. So thank you. He is my moderator here. So thank you, Tim. So today we're gonna talk about native herbaceous perennials for the suburban yard. Uh, how many of you consider yourselves beginners? I hope most of you do because you might be too advanced for my presentation. I, I am not a botanist, <laughs> though I pretend to be one, right? <laughs> I majored in economics in college, so I never took um, botany formally or anything, but as Tim said, I've been a member of the Native Plant Society for many, many years. Um, so, with that, let's start. I'm gonna have to be kind of tethered to this microphone, I suppose. So first we'll start with what is a herbaceous perennial? Um, that's kind of a off-putting word and I, I kind of regretted that it's part of the title here because if you're beginners, you might think, hmm, what in the world is that? Well, a herbaceous perennial, is simply a non-woody plant, so it's not a tree or a shrub, and the top growth dies down annually, but the crowns, roots, bulbs, rhizomes survive over the winter. So they come back year after year. Um, I think a perennial is defined as coming back at least two years in a row. Otherwise, they're a biennial or you know, an annual is just once one growing season. Many people in Prince William County live in these kind of houses. They're popping up all over and they're a big house on a, on a big, you know, pasture land or something. So when you buy this kind of house, where do you even start? You know, you wanna put in some native plants and you know, you have tabula rasa. I wanna stress the importance of layers, canopy trees, 
And if you have that kind of property, you want to put in your trees first because they take the longest to grow. Understory trees, your smaller trees, you know, your dogwoods and red buds and stuff. Shrubs and woody vines, you know, more woody plants. But what we're going to talk about today are herbaceous plants. So, you know, they die back over the season, you know, over the winter. So let's start with some elements that I think you should adhere to when you design your garden. Oh, did it? There you go. Sorry about that. The video was off. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I could see it, so I don't know. <laughs> Work with your existing conditions. You know, some people, you know, might have a really wet yard, and yet they want to try and grow, you know, cactus or something, or, you know, that's just not what we want to do in the native plant world. We want to work with what we have. Oops. Uh -oh. oh, well, hmm. Right plant, right place. You know, you plant a shade-loving plant in the shade. You plant a water-loving plant in the wet spot, that kind of thing. Don't think, oh, I'm going to plant this plant that really likes moisture, and I'll just water it. I mean, that's just not the way you should try and do it. It's going to be too hard of maintenance for you, and that's just not natural. Test your soil. See if it's alkaline or, or um, acidic and whether it needs, you know, some compost or organic matter. And then, you know, look at your conditions as whether you have sun, shade, wet, dry, acid, whatever. So that all comes to play in what you select for your garden. So I'm going to take you on some native plants for your garden through the seasons. So right here we have spring with a bluebell, um, summer represented by a bee balm, fall represented by um, an aster and winter with some golden groundsel that has um, has evergreen foliage. So native plants for spring blooms. Here we have columbine and wild geranium. One of your really great spring flowers are violets. Um, they are many different kinds. The one in the upper left is your common violet. Um, actually, this one is called Confederate violet because of the shading, um, but it's the same species as the other common violet in the upper right. So they're both um, violas, soria. And then we have on the bottom, Canada violet, very pretty, doesn't spread as much. And keep your violets. I mean, people fight against violets because they want the lawn. Usually you have the violets because your lawn is too shady or too moist, you know? So go with what, what you have. And larval hosts for fritillary butterflies. So the fritillary butterfly caterpillars lay their eggs on the violets and the caterpillars are supported by these violets. So let's not kill, fritillary butterflies are gorgeous. And here's another, um, this is, um, Striped, striped violet viola striata, and then we even have an oxymoronic um, yellow violet. So violets come in those three colors essentially. So I'll, this is one of my favorite combinations, and this is from my yard: bluebells and what we call golden groundsel, or Golden rag or I try to get people to say golden ground. So I've heard um, some kind of landscape designer call it that. And I thought that sounds so much prettier than golden rag or so, you know, it's still the same botanically. Whoops, went the wrong way. So here's a close up of a bluebell. And here's a close up of the golden ground. So, and, you know, blue and yellow look really nice together. Um, the bluebell is what we call ephemeral. At, by May, it, it blooms in early April, sometimes the end of March, um, usually is prolific in the beginning of April, and then it dies back completely. So you need something to carry on there, like ferns that might come up or something like that. But it will die back, just like, you know, daffodils or tulips or something like that, to come back next year. 
but you won't see any trace of it later on in the season. But it's one of my real favorites. So that's the Pacara aurea and Mertensia virginica. Now, some of you might find that these botanical names are a little off-putting, you know, these Latin names. Um, we use them because they're more precise. You know, people will call bluebells, you know, Spanish bluebells or English bluebells. I just call them bluebells, and they're all different, all different kinds of um, species. So this is to be more precise so we actually know what you're talking about. But don't be put off by that. But it is very useful when you go to a nursery to look for the tag to actually see what, what it is. Here's a really nice one, Eastern Columbine. Now, I think of this one as blooming when the hummingbirds return from the south. And it's there to greet them and provide them with nectar. Now, Nancy Lawson just said they don't need red flowers, but um, they do definitely come to these red flowers. The picture in, in the center is what the foliage looks like. And I've heard some people say that they're actually seeing the foliage start to come up now. And one thing about these Eastern Columbine, if they're happy, they might stay blooming through the summer. I see them on um, Skyline Drive and they're blooming, you know, even in September. They're not as prolific, but they are still blooming. And they have such pretty foliage that's kind of lacy. Another one of my spring favorites, wild geranium. It's another shade lover. It can take a little bit more sun. Um, it was our 2020 wildflower of the year. So we actually have a brochure on that plant in particular. So if you come to our table there, you can take one of those brochures and read a little more in depth about wild geranium. I see Janet in this audience here. She has beautiful bluebells and wild geraniums in her garden. And she's been on our garden tour several times. Here's one with the yellow. It seems like there's a lot of yellow and blue in, in the springtime. Um, Zizia aria or golden alexanders. Some people think they look like um, Queen Anne's lace or a yellow Queen Anne's lace. And most people are kind of familiar with Queen Anne's lace, even though it's European, not a native. But it's it has that kind of foliage. It's in the same family. It's in, you know, the, I guess, parsley carrot family, whatever you want to call it. But it is a larval host for the black swallow butterfly. And some people will see black swallow butterflies laying eggs on their parsley or something. Well, it's all in the same family. So, but this is the native host for the black swallow tail butterfly, a beautiful large butterfly. Zetos, this is kind of a niche flower or kind of a cute one. Um, it's a nice little ground cover. It does like um, sun and kind of dry conditions. There are several different um, species of pussy toes. So I call it, and you know, when you see the, the Latin name and then the word SP behind it, it means species. So there are different, the first name is the genus. So it's a little broader. And then the second name would be the individual species. But we have several native you know, like field um, pussy toes and some others. So that's why I just call it species. So it encompasses the whole genus. It's a larval host plant for American lady butterfly. And it's a really pretty butterfly. Now look here, if you look closely, you can see the, um, the caterpillar. Here's the large one and there's a small one. So the large one at the top and then a small one down there. And then to see what the butterfly actually looks like, there it is. The American lady is so pretty. It's not a very big butterfly, it's sort of medium small, but it's very beautiful. Jack in the pulpit, sort of an interesting plant. A lot of people have heard of it. It has a cool name. It's not really, you know, a flower, a showy flower or anything. It has this spade with a hood over it. And it looks like a little man in his pulpit, you know, delivering a sermon. And some of them are, the hoods are kind of greenish and white. And then some are a little more purplish under the hood. If you see that over there on the right-hand side. And if it's kept moist enough over the season, over the summer, you might be lucky enough to get the berries. So these berries are uh, ripened in the fall and, you know, turtles and whatnot 
like to eat them, but they are very stunning to see them on the forest floor, that bright red. No wildflower garden, um, spring shade wildflower garden, let me say, is complete without wild blue flocks. Here's a picture of it, I think, in Riverbend Park, right next to the Potomac River. Um, gorgeous plant, also called um, Wild Sweet William. It has a very nice scent, especially in mass. And there's a little more close up to it. And here's the close, even closer picture of it. There are a number of phloxes that are native to our area and they're in the Plant Nova Natives Guides. And you can see that online. Not everything is flowering. Don't forget ferns. Ferns are great for your um, spring shade garden. These, this is a fiddlehead. It's just coming out. When somebody says, oh, look at the fiddleheads, they don't mean that it's a name of a species. That's just the, the growth, you know, the original growth coming out of the ground is a fiddlehead and then the fronds um, unfurl. This one is sensitive fern. It likes to grow in sort of a moist area and it's sensitive. My partner and I used to like to tease about that. Oh, don't insult the sensitive fern. It'll be very, you know, sad. And it's sensitive to um, frost. So it's one of the first that will, you know, die back when frost comes. But don't speak meanly to it. Okay. <laughs> And this is a really gorgeous one. You need to have pretty good soil for this one, um, acidic and very rich soil. Um, the Northern Maiden hair fern is just so delicate and gorgeous. Um, I can't grow it in my yard, but I really appreciate it out in the wild. And people that do have it in their garden are so, um, so fortunate, but it is a beautiful fern. Here's another fern, um, cinnamon fern, and it's called cinnamon because it looks like Cinnamon sticks poking up, those brown cinnamon sticks are the fertile fronds. So um, that's what it looks like in the spring. And they can have great areas if they have enough moisture. This one is a royal fern. These have large leaves. Um, so the fronds are like double or triply pinnate or whatever, but it, it doesn't look quite as ferny to me but it is a very lovely, lovely fern to have. And it likes moisture too. And here's one of our most common ferns, um, the Christmas fern. And here, it stays evergreen um, through the winter. And that's one of the reasons that it's called Christmas fern. Another reason is that the individual leaflets kind of look a little bit like a Santa's stocking or something, so, or a Santa's boot. Yeah. I, I don't really see that, but it is, uh, does stay green. So there's the Christmas fern. And here's a Christmas fern, you know, standing erect. If you keep it over the winter, it will sort of lie down. And then when the new foliage starts coming, when the new um, fiddleheads come up, you might want to cut off the old foliage if, if you're into neat gardening, which I'm not, but you know, it does make it a little neater and you know, as a homeowners association or something. Now we go into the summer. Here, um, I think Nancy Lawson had a hummingbird moth, a snowberry clear wing moth or something on Minarda fistulosa. It's called, she called it bergamo, I call it bergamot, whatever. Um, and then also that bergamot is, has a, a monarch butterfly nectaring on it. So it is um, very attractive to pollinators. Bee balm. Now I call this one bee balm, the red bee balm. Some people call the other, the bergamot, bee balm too. So that's the trouble with these common names. So this is Monarda didyma. All these Monardas are a type of mint. Um, they will spread Monarda fistulosa, the pre the lighter, the purple, light purple one spreads a lot. Um, I once made the mistake of having both the purple and the red together and the purple overran the red. I really love the red. I don't have that much sun in my yard, so I will grow it in a pot, stick it where the sun is. And then if I'm gonna sit out on my deck, I'll bring the pot next to me so that the hummingbirds will come and visit, you know. 
So we do what we can, but I don't have the right habitat for it as my, um, I just live on a 10 uh, quarter acre lot and it's kind of closed in since I've lived there over 30 years. I love my trees. Garden flocks. This is another flock that you can have that's native. Um, again, there's a um, hummingbird moth. There's no very clear wing moth. You know, some people see that and think, oh, it's a baby hummingbird. No, it's a moth, but it, it does mimic kind of the hummingbird pattern, you know, the flight and, and the nectaring. It's a really cool insect. It's very large, you know, and there's several different species. Here's a, a wider patch of garden flocks, and here's another patch of it. It grows to be about two feet or so. One of the things about our summer plants, for the most part, they're kind of tall. Now you can do something to keep them shorter um, around May. You can cut them back, something called the Chelsea Chop, which Lori Dodd in our Facebook group will always talk about. Um, she's one of our administrators from the Facebook group, but Chelsea Chop, and that way your perennials will still bloom and they'll just be shorter. You don't want to wait too long because you might sacrifice the blooms. I once did that with a plant and I was very sad. So do it early enough and do it short enough. Oops. Okay. Milkweeds. Everybody's heard about milkweeds, right? I mean, even beginners know that this is the monarch butterfly plant. Um, right here on the left, we have it on common milkweed. Um, you can see that this is actually <clears throat> a male. You see those two wide areas there that indicates it's a male monarch. A female monarch has um, does not have that wide space there and all of the veining is a lot thicker. So, and then we have a beautiful fritillary butterfly on purple milkweed. Purple milkweed is my absolute favorite, but it's difficult to grow. Uh, I see it in the wild at Huntley Meadows Park. It's also at Merrimack Farm. It's gorgeous. <coughs> Here we have swamp milkweed. Now swamp milkweed might sound like it will only grow in wetlands, and it does. I see that growing in, in standing water actually, but it can take a, a moist garden spot. Don't put it in a dry, you know, desert kind of spot, but it's a beautiful one. It has narrower leaves than the common and, and the purple has wider leaves too. And then there's a lot of people's favorite, the butterfly weed or butterfly flower, um, the orange milkweed. I think some even, I think Doug Ptolemy, who did the film at the beginning, says we should call that monarch delight rather than milkweed, because who wants to buy a weed? But it really does uh, bring in a lot of pollinators and it can support the milk, the monarchs who can only lay their eggs on milkweeds. I mean, if it lays its egg somewhere else, it's, those caterpillars are not gonna survive. Black-eyed Susans, everybody knows black-eyed Susans. It's the state flower of Maryland. Um, you know, common flower, kind of like a daisy. We call that a composite flower. Um, there are a couple of different species. Um, Pogida and Herda. And they bloom when the, um, when the gold, um, goldfinches come. Um, goldfinches are one of the birds that do not eat caterpillars. I mean, do not feed caterpillars to their young. You know, you had the Doug Ptolemy show saying how, you know, chickadees and stuff and all these birds need the soft body caterpillars. Golden, <clears throat> and golden, <laughs> gold finches are the exception. They can fly around and have fun all, all summer long. And then toward August is when they finally have to get down and, and you know, nest and, that's when the seed heads are ripe and then they can feed their young. I'm glad to see that Harry Glasgow has now joined us, my partner. <laughs> so have a seat, please. A lot of young guys. Yeah. Blazing Star, Liatris, there are a number of different kinds. Um, a lot of people like the Liatris spicata because um, it's a tall, it's not that, I mean, it's a couple of feet, 
the scaly um, blazing star isn't sold quite as much. Oops. What happened? Okay. <laughs> um, isn't sold quite as much in the trade. It's shorter, but you can see that definitely out in the wild, like in Manassas National Battlefield Park, um, deep cut meadow. And there, once again, one of my favorite insects, the um, hummingbird moth. This is a plant that you have to have in your garden for pollinators. I've never seen so many different kinds of bees and other insects than on what we call short tooth mountain mint. It has a wider leaf um, and it has very small flowers. Here you can see, um, I, that might be an Eastern tail blue on it. Um, they're very small flowers, but these pollinators just really go to them. Now, I think it has gorgeous foliage. It has this silvery green kind of foliage. So it looks really pretty with your fl other flowering plants because the flowers are not that significant. That's not the beauty of it in your garden. Um, you know, if you just garden for, you know, for looks, for the plants themselves, uh, this the color of the leaves is just striking. It's a mint, mints do spread. So just be aware of that but it's a wonderful native mint and you can give it to your friends or, you know, swap it around. Yeah, I mean, this one that I just put up, uh, I think that's a thread leaf um, wasp. It's just so cool. I mean, the one on the, the butterfly in the upper right is a buckwheat. I mean, <laughs> um, Buck eye butterfly, yes, thank you. I didn't get much sleep last night, so. <laughs> um, and if anybody um, enjoyed the um, biscotti or muffins, I made them last night. <laughs> so anyway, um, but see, this attracts butterflies and all kinds of insects and bees. Short tooth mountain mountain. Joe Pieweed, it's our wildflower of the year this year. And I so hope that I would have had a brochure with the a today, but I haven't gotten them from the printer yet. Um, so we are featuring that in the Native Plant Society right now. It's another pollinator favorite. And Joe Pieweed is one that needs that Chelsea chop, unless you have a place in the back of your border or something where it can grow. Because I have some in the back of my, you know, in a corner of my fence that I let grow to be eight feet tall. Um, there is a cultivar, I think it's called Little Joe. You know, we don't necessarily, you know, recommend cultivars, um, but if you're in a, you know, an HOA or something, you might have to go that way. But such a beautiful plant, and often it's a magnet for um, our swallowtail, tiger swallowtail butterfly, which happens to be the um, Virginia insect, our state insect, is the tiger swallowtail butterfly. So you can chop it back and then it will bloom a little later. It blooms, you know, July, August time frame. Culver's root is something that I um, discovered more recently. We, um, we have a pollinator planting out at the Dale City Rest Area on 95 northbound and two large beds there. And Culver's root was something that VDOT um, provided and we planted. And it's a really neat spiky kind of plant. Looks good with your, you know, contrasting. Oh, that is, oops. Did I just lose it? Oh, man. It's no, it's oh, well, this one, I'm on the wrong screen. I mean, <laughs> it's way back. Okay. All right, I hope it, no? Yeah, okay. Here it is in my yard. Um, you can see some, I think that's flocks down at the bottom there. It does like sun. I have one small sunny bed. Um, this is not matching up. 
I'm far advanced here. Let me see. Technology works when it's work. I mean, it's great when it works, when it doesn't. Hmm. It's not advancing for me. I mean, this was advancing, but it wasn't doing that. Because that's not showing. This part's not showing there. Um, all right, let me go ahead. But this, okay. <laughs> but he had some huge swaths of it at the, um, at the rest area, 95, just gorgeous. That, that was Dale City? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot now what the mile marker is. Which one are you? I am, um, wait a minute, this one, no, yeah, yeah. this one? third one, yeah. And then which slide were you at? We were on, keep going. This is 26. Yes, this one. Okay, there you go. okay, well, okay. And then let me make sure. That's why we have tech support. <laughs> Try your clicker. Okay, I use my clicker. Okay, so that's the one in my garden. Okay. And then this is at the rest area. And you can see a nice expanse of it. It's very beautiful. <laughs> okay. Something for the shade in the, in the summertime is um, a wild petunia. I should have read, written Ruelia species because there are a couple of different species. Um, these bloom for just a day. But a lot of you are familiar with day lilies, right? They bloom for another, one day, drop off, another one blooms. So it has nice success in bloom for you know a few weeks even. So, but it, it can take dry shade. So it's it's nice to have a little color. Uh, and mine have started seeding around a little bit. New York ironweed. I can think of those um, New York ironweeds as somewhat similar to. Joe pie weed, um, same fluffy kind of flowers, attract a lot of pollinators. These bloom a little later in the summer. And it can get really tall too. So this is another one that you need to chop back. And here I have a picture of a monarch butterfly in the lower left at the Dale City um, pollinator planting. And there's a little closer up of, of the New York iron weed. There are some other Bernonias out there, um, but this is the one that you would most commonly find in nurseries, and it is native to old Northern Virginia. And moving into late summer into autumn. It seems like we're kind of sort of muddying up the seasons now. A lot of these things that used to bloom in the fall, you know, are blooming more and more, you know, and even in late July or something. But here's, this is at the uh, pollinator planting at the rest area, um, this, this goldenrod. Now, some of you might've heard, oh, goldenrod, you know, causes allergies, it makes me sneeze, blah, blah, blah. It is not goldenrod. It is um, ragweed that blooms the same time as goldenrod. Goldenrod is insect pollinated. So its pollen doesn't fly around in the air like ragweed pollen. Ragweed is wind pollinated, so it throws that pollen near far and wide. So, so the poor maligned goldenrod belongs in your garden. Blue mist flower, I love this one. It looks so iridescently beautiful um, in the evenings, early mornings. Um, it blooms when all of these buckeye butterflies are out. Buckeye butterflies come out in the late summer and fall. They're ones that migrate too, like monarchs, but they don't migrate as far. So you will see them a lot in the fall. And they love blue mist flower. Blue mist flower, if you give it really rich conditions or a lot of moisture, it might be a thug in your garden. But, you know, just give it ordinary kind of soil and ignore it. And, It'll be a star. Yeah, here's a, a group, that, you know, just a spread of it. It is one that comes up a little later in the spring. So you might think, oh, it died out. I don't have it anymore. Give it some time. You know, it might not come up until early May. And that's a pearl crescent on it. Then there's the lobelias. 
which is cardinal flower, as Nancy Lawson showed. You know, it's a hummingbird magnet. <clears throat> so you can have, you know, the columbine in the spring, then the monarda in the summer, and then the lobelia, you know, kind of feeds those hummingbirds through its cycle. Just a gorgeous plant. It does like moisture. So um, it can take um, really hot sun if it's in a moist area. Otherwise, it needs a little more shade. And here's the great blue lobelia. So it's the same kind of shaped flower, but not quite as showy as that red of the cardinal flower. Both of them do like kind of moist soil. Here's another one that really likes moist soil, which I wish I could grow. I saw it in somebody's yard and thought it was just fabulous. And I always look for it um, in some parks around here is the bottle gentian, also called closed gentian. This is how it blooms. It doesn't open. This particular plant, I mean, that's its flower. I mean, I think it's gorgeous. Some people say, well, when does it open? It doesn't. And it's funny what pollinators will do is they will um, cheat trying to get into the, to get the pollen or nectar is they will bite the side of the, the flower and go in that way rather than try to pull the petals apart. They will try and go in by the side. So I love it. Goldenrods, you can have them for shade, for sun. Most of you think of goldenrods as growing out in the field, you know, and it's a sunny field, but we have some, a couple of very nice um, species that grow in the shade. We have zigzag goldenrod, and you can see how, how many flower heads it has, and it grows in a more upright form. Then we have this thing called blue stem, or um, it's also called wreath goldenrod, and it grows in really a pretty deep shade, but it adds, you know, that, that lightness in the in the fall for you. Very delicate looking. And then these are some other goldenrods that like sun, you know, stiff goldenrod, Canada goldenrod with the, you know, of course it has to have the monarch on it and a buckeye butterfly on it. But if you're gonna plant a fall garden, you need asters too. Asters and goldenrods are the backbone of your fall garden. We have aromatic aster, we have white wood aster. White wood aster grows in the shade. Um, it's a very nice ground cover plant if you don't have to have a ground cover that's you know just three inches tall. You know, it will cover the ground and I like it very much. I remember um, one of these um, landscape designers said he liked to put the white wood aster around his really fancy or expensive plants because it'll keep the deer out of those, you know. And deer don't particularly like white wood aster. So, but you know, if they're hungry enough, they'll eat anything. And besides the um, asters, Helen's flower, which I like better than sneeze weed, it doesn't cause you to sneeze. It's a sad I mean, I also call it Hellenium because that's a pretty name. That's part of the genus name, the Latin name. Um, very pretty flower, but apparently years ago, they used to make snuff out of it, you know, so they stuff it in their cheeks and I guess, you know, made them sneeze or whatever, or just stuffed up their noses, I should say. Um, but it's a beautiful flower. And <clears throat> on the lower right there, that's um, a pollinator planting out near Blandy Experimental Farm, you know, the State Arboretum. It's at a park and ride, and it has some really great hellenium there. But look at the ones on the small picture on the left. That is a monarch caterpillar. What is a monarch caterpillar doing on hellenium? Because you all know that's the only plant the only plant that a monarch, butter, monarch caterpillar can eat is a milkweed. This is not a milkweed. Well, if you notice the shape of him, he is getting ready to form his chrysalis. They, he's pretty big and he's gonna get into a J shape 
and he's going to form his chrysalis. They don't form their chrysalises on milkweeds generally. They move over to something else. They'll go on your wall, your the wall of your house. They'll go on a fence. They'll go on a you know weird spots, but they won't go on the milkweed to be to um, pupate. So I just found that interesting to see that guy there. Um, another fall one is the white turtle head. Um, it's sort of a snapdragon-like kind of flower. And if you want to be playful with kids, you can make it talk, you know, by pinching the sides and whatever. It likes it kind of moist and partial shade. Um, there's also a pink turtle head, but it is not native to Virginia. So we're concentrating on Virginia here. There is white turtle head that grows in Huntley Meadows Park in, Ar in Alexandria that doesn't seem to bloom until late September. Some, I don't know why it's so late, but I've seen other people in their gardens, they have it blooming in July. So, you know, it's a late summer to fall kind of plant. And it is the larval host to, I think the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. Narrow leaf or swamp sunflower. Um, when you call it swamp sunflower, people think you have to have a really wet spot. Well, this is in my yard and it is not wet. It is quite dry where it is planted. Um, and this one can grow to be 10 or 12 feet high. <laughs> and it is the last herbaceous perennial to bloom in my yard. And in, the, in my yard, it doesn't bloom until October. Um, and I kind of like a few of them to be really, really tall. So I, I enjoy that. Now we move into winter. Not too much blooming in winter, but if you just leave your stems, they can look so cool. You know, these flowering, these, these seed heads will feed the, the birds uh, over the winter and nourish your soul when you look out there and, and just see all their shapes. And, and when snow comes, you know, snow on goldenrod seeds, very, very pretty. You know, so leave them through the winter if you can. Then, are the things that are green through the winter? Well, yes, we talked about this before. It's the golden ground sole, um, Pacara aurea. And if you look closely in this picture, in the upper left is a carex. Yeah, I can't remember if that's um, seersec or sedge or what, but. Carexes will stay green over the winter. So if you want to have some greenery there, that's that's something that you can plant. Now let me just go through some combos. I know that Stephanie is giving a program on, you know, companion plants and stuff, but just to give you some ideas, again, here's the bluebell, bluebird, <laughs> bluebells, <laughs> and golden ground so together. So pretty. Um, this happens to be in my yard. I have a lot of bluebells in my little, you know, quarter acre lot. They love it. I don't have very acid soil and they just, and it's moist enough, but not, not what you would, it doesn't look like a floodplain. Here's some from somebody's garden. It has phlox and Canada violets and something I didn't mention was foam flower, Tiarella cordifolia, and then it has a hosta. Now I look at this hosta and think, God, that looks out of place. Maybe some of you like that, you know, contrast or whatever, but I love the white with the, with the purple. Whoops. And then we had that bone set. Um, Nancy Lawson talked about bone set being such a great plant. And this is at that um, pollinator planting in I-95. So. The asters? Um, I think that's aster in the background, yes. Yeah, and there's even one right in the middle of the, of the bone set right there. Yeah. Joe pie weed with some sunflowers. This is at Shenandoah National Park on Skyline Drive, you know, goldenrod and asters. What more could you want? This is at Merrimack Farm, the wildlife management garden, I mean, wildlife garden um, behind the stone house there. Um, a lot of flocks, a lot of monarda, some cup plant, that yellow is cup plant that I didn't um, highlight here. And then there is some purple coneflower 
Everybody thinks it's native. It's not native to Virginia, but you know, it does attract a lot of butterflies. It's it's native to states farther west, you know, more prairie areas. It does so well. I know it does well here. Is the white native? White no sunflower. The white uh, sunflower? No. No. Okay, once again, goldenrods and asters. Look at the pollinators on there. Um, here's an uh, aster with the buckeye butterfly. Even if you have a small space, you can plant natives. This is a townhouse garden. It has um, golden alexanders and alum root and um, foam flower. Green and gold. Green and gold, yes, croissant, you know, in the lower left. Nancy, what is the white thing? Is white bee? That is foam flower, cordifolia. I did not highlight that, but we always have that in our plant sale, which is the day before Mother's Day in Manassas. This is my little yard in the springtime. Um, I did say you need layers, so I have a couple of canopy trees here. I have a hickory and a white oak. I have um, red buds and dogwoods. I have um, a couple of um, shrubs, maple leaf, I burn them and some other things. And then, you know, bluebells and other, other plants. That's my favorite time of the year because I have so much shade. It's, you know, the best flowering time. Here's another garden um, which shows a lot of wild blue phlox and some other plants, native and non-native. Um, buckeye, which is not native to our area. And then I think that's golden brown sole in the bottom. Um, a mixture of golden rods and blue mist flower. This is in my yard. Uh, my one sunny bed on the other side of my driveway here, um, you know, golden rods and asters just bring in those butterflies. This was a really good year a couple of years ago for monarch butterflies. And I think I had a picture where it had seven of them, but this one was a little clearer. I think you could just plant, you can, you can count maybe four butterflies in here. So those are the flowers that I decided to highlight. Um, it's, it's hard to choose, you know, they're all wonderful, you know, but I, I pared it down to that. Um, I recommend that anybody who lives in Northern Virginia, check out plantnovanatives.org, a wealth of information there. This is, um, the, um, coral honeysuckle or trumpet honeysuckle. Um, blooms in April and will then bloom sporadically sometimes through November. And that's, so this is the logo for the Plant Nova Natives. If you want to, you can take a picture of this screen. This has a bunch of resources that you can use. Um, there's a fritillary butterfly over there. Um, I'll give you a moment there. And then, And to conclude, does anybody have any questions? I'm in the bluebells. They're coming soon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Merrimack Farm Wildlife Management Area has a bluebell festival on April 8th this year. So mark your calendars to come out for that. It's sponsored by the Prince William Conservation Alliance. And we're, we have a booth and we also um, try to sell some bluebells there. Questions? Way in the back of the red. And you said uh, that the combination with the Pacularia with the Virginia bluebell. But you know, the Pacularia in my yard is uh, sluggish and, you know, it's going to really stop there. You know, it covers the landscape pretty well. Does the bluebell go through that? I mean, right. well, actually, I have mine separated by uh, some stones, but they, you know, the bluebells are lower and then the Aphoros behind it, so, but they just look really good together, I think. Yes, question back there, pink scarf. Um, I've seen that with the blue bells, it looks great. Is that not native? I love wood poppies, and yes, I have wood poppies, but they are not native to our area. They are native to a couple of counties in southwestern Virginia. And I actually saw them in the wild and 
They don't grow like they do around here if you put them in the garden. There's just one here, one there. They are prolific in our gardens. So I do like the combination, but I don't recommend it to people because it's not native to our area. But it is a Virginia native. Yes. In front? Yeah. I, I just planted some bluebells for this year, um, but I put them under a uh, black walnut tree because they said that they can grow. But would the ground cell work under a black walnut tree, though? I don't know that. Yeah. Can't plant everything under a black walnut. But I think we're finding that there are not as many plants that will grow. I mean, there are more plants that grow under black walnuts than previously thought. So I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah. just see. Yeah. Thank Back you. here. I don't think it's right me asking this question. I feel like I ask it all the time. I know the deer will eat anything if they're hungry, <laughs> but are any of these plants that are less likely to be that eat by the deer? Yeah, um, the white wood asters, the mints, they don't like mints, so Monarda and your mountain mints, they generally don't eat bluebells. And this is a good segue into an announcement that the Prince William Wildflower Society and some other um, partner organizations are going to sponsor a, um, a, a author event is what we call it. It'll be our 11th annual author event on March 5th at Manassas Park Community Center. Um, it's a Sunday afternoon, and we have an author, um, Ruth Clausen, who wrote um, Deer Resistant Native Plants for the Northeast. So I urge you to come to that. I think we have flyers on our um, Prince William Wildfire Society table out there. So, you know, come on out to that. Do you have any questions online, Tim? No, I didn't see him. Okay, back here. Yeah. Exactly, aroma stuff. You know, if you have a spice bush or something. But, yeah. But yet they will eat cedar trees. They will eat holly trees, but it's not their preferred food. Yes. What do they eat? Coneflowers, yeah, they like that. <laughs> yeah, but hostas are not native, so have at it. <laughs> so we have a few minutes more. Um, question in the front. question, but I have several the plants that you have recommended, but they're not doing well. So you have several of the plants that I've recommended, but they're not doing well. So maybe they're not cited right. Maybe you didn't have your soil tested to see, you know, acid versus, you know, alkaline or the moisture level. You know, there are a lot of things to consider. So, yeah, and you just keep trying. <laughs> maybe go for something else. And yes, again? The um, wild geranium. Um, you said that it totally dies, so it dies back. Because so I put a couple of those in last year, and I I don't know that they don't seem to be there anymore. So the, well, lost them. They can keep their foliage pretty long through the season if it's moist enough. But look for it to come out. But you should talk to Janet next to you, who is a who has has them up the wazula. Yeah, it is too early for them to be to see them coming up now. Well, I thank you all for coming um, and get out there and plant. Okay.